have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Counselor, it is Wednesday. It is time for an all new episode of the show. If you are unfamiliar with the show, if this is your first time checking it out, just a little recap of what the premise is. I am a comedian from Boston. I'm a huge television fan. I own pretty much every issue of TV Guide. Someone picks an issue from my collection, they go through it, they write down what they would have watched that week in television, and then we discuss their choices. This week, my guest is writer director Rick Sloan. We break format a little bit. He kind of goes through some old TV guides in general and not just one specific issue. But Rick is a fascinating guy. Uh, if you don't know him by name, you probably know him by reputation or by his work. He is the writer-director of the Vice Academy series of movies, which were a staple on USA Up All Night, of which I was a frequent watcher. And also, he made the movie Hobgoblins, which is a favorite of MST3K fans the world over. We talk about both those things in this episode. But Rick, more, even more interestingly, is the first guest I've had who has actually written written and published one of the TV Guide crossword puzzles. The crossword puzzles we haven't really discussed that much on the show thus far, but I, I did do them every week, and Rick actually wrote one. So we'll hear that story in this episode. We'll hear a lot of fun stories about growing up in Hollywood. So please enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, writer, director, Rick Sloan. Mr. Rick Sloan. Rick, thank you so much for doing the show. Oh, th thanks for thinking of me. You're quite welcome. I, uh, I'm a big fan of the Vice Academy movies, and I, I definitely watch them on TV all the time on, on USA Up All Night, which was a which was a huge thing for me when I was growing up. And so, uh, you know, I listen to your commentary tracks a lot, and uh, you're very interesting, and you have a great story, so I thought you'd be a great guest for, for the show. This actually... Um this and next week, it's the 25th anniversary of when Vice Academy first debuted in VHS. Oh, that's amazing. And you were saying you were going to try and do a reunion show? Are you still thinking of trying to do that? I've been tempted. I know the Hobgoblins reunion was really tricky, getting everybody back. Um, Vice Academy, because it's all it would be about the core main group, but I would right. probably combine all the films, because I'm not going to do a reunion for each movie. Each movie, yeah, because there were so, six of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Ginger, as odd as it sounds, would probably be on board. Linnea yeah. doesn't live in L.A., so she'd probably be more difficult at this point. Right, right, right. But it's hard to say. Yeah, well, maybe maybe it'll have already happened <laughs> by the time people hear this. <laughs> uh, so what's really fascinating to me is that you grew up here. You grew up in, in Hollywood, and you actually went to Hollywood High. Yes, I did. Which sounds like some sort, for, for people like me or people that grew up in you know Boston or places like Boston, that sounds like some sort of mythological place. I imagine it was probably not quite that way, but what was was that like growing up here? Did that affect the way that you watch things? Hollywood High, it's kind of, while I was there, they actually did a TV show called Hollywood High, and it was a big right. deal. They told everyone not to watch it. They uh, told it you a, not to watch it? It was a horrible show. I mean, they didn't get permission from the school. Right. They, the school actually refused it, so they just had one opening shot of the school. From like across the street? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is, if every year in the newspaper, they would rate all the Los Angeles schools in terms of, you know, best grade scores. And every year, usually Pacific Palisades High School would come in first or second. Hollywood High would always come in second or third from the bottom. Right. It's, it's not an academical school. It's just the actual map of where you have to live to go to Hollywood High. It goes far to the east. So... The number one subject of Hollywood High School is English as a second language, so it was oh, never really? okay. a particularly because it's pretty urban for for LA. I mean, it's right on sun, 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 sunset on Sunset Boulevard. Right? It's more it? third world than okay, urban, is the word <laughs> third I would world urban. <laughs> it, but I imagine you probably went to school with, although I guess maybe they were going to Beverly Hills High, like either you know actors' children or child actors or people that were on television. Were they going to Hollywood High or the sort of private school kind of kids? Um. Well, I went to school with Allison Arger of Little House on the Prairie. We actually knew each other from junior high was where we first met. So that must have been strange where... So I always kind of theorize that when you're watching television as a kid, the first time you sort of realize that it's artificial, that people are acting and that people are writing this, you sort of... It's a little bit harder to enjoy it at that point because you sort of see the strings a little bit. And I wonder if growing up around here, 
you would see that much earlier, like attending school with someone who's on Little House, which was a huge show. Did that make it more difficult for you to watch that? Well, this was high school. I mean, I kind of knew Little House in high school. Yeah. I mean, I knew at four years old when I would watch Gilligan's Island that it wasn't real, that they weren't going to get rescued, that these were actors. And when the show ended, they would all go home. Um, And that just hit you on your (laughs) own or were your parents like, this is garbage. I never thought TV was real. I mean, I didn't really believe any of these shows. I mean, right. Gilligan's Island was so hokey and outlandish. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even as a child, I knew it was fake. Yeah, but I dream a genie. Very realistic. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was much more realistic. So then, so then you weren't. That wasn't really an issue for you, I imagine. But you did you just always want to be in the business because it just seemed to be like the industry around here, and that's what you do. Um, going to school in junior high and high school with people who were in the business. There was something, I never asked Allison how much she made, but she was constantly being hounded by people in school. And she never said it. I'm not sure how I found this out, but a lot of those child stars were making $1,000 a week for those shows. And yeah, I was, I mean, the idea that most kids are working after school for two or three bucks an hour, yeah, so I'm making a grand in a week. Yeah. Oh, I know how I knew. My, um, later on, my tax accountant actually, um, represented all the new Mouseketeers in like 77 to 79. Oh, okay. And that was the first time I actually asked how much were those kids making. Right. And it was generally like 700 to a $1,000 a week. So you were like, I want to get in this industry. There's some money here. Yeah. I mean, th- that was a really unheard of amount for a teenager to be making. Oh, absolutely. These were kids who didn't have driver's licenses. Right, right, right. I imagine their parents probably pocketed quite a, quite a bit of that money. But um, so you and you were driven to writing first probably more than anything else or you didn't want to be an actor i never wanted to be an actor yeah you're always uh, i'm a behind the scenes guy i was writing scripts um i think 15 and 16 i was already at it um the very first tv show i ever saw taped live was laverne and shirley and definitely left an impact on me i just remember the pace they went out of people running and moving cables really quickly right. to get the next shot. Cause they have a one night to film this thing and it's, it's important they get it done. And you know, that two hour window or something. Cause I remember, I don't remember the exact order, but I wrote a script for Laverne and Shirley never got made. Uh, I wrote a script for three's company because my English teacher in high school knew John Ritter. That one, that one never got submitted because he said the script was too perverted, which was kind of the point. Too perverted for Three's Company is pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. I mean, that show was pretty... Too perverted for an English teacher. Yeah, well, that's extra that's extra impressive. Not so, really. <laughs> when you went to go see a, um, a taping of Laverne and Shirley, I, I always imagined that it, it was sort of hard for them to get people to go to all these tapings because there were so many of them. Did, they, did you actively seek it out or were they kind of like just handing out tickets? Like, how did it... They were shooting so many sitcoms and things here at that time. Did you, were you already a fan of Laverne and Shirley and wanted to go? Or was it kind of like, a, oh, let's go to this thing? I definitely wanted to go. The um, size of the audience in those shows is only about 100 people. That's very, very small. So um, it's not like, like a game show or something like The Tonight Show where they're shooting one every single day and people right. just line up not really caring which episode it's going to be. Right. You actually did have to write in and get tickets and they'd be months in advance for those shows. Right. So... I don't want to say it was somewhat elitist to get in, but it definitely wasn't something they were, they weren't giving out free tickets. Right. Them. You had to earn that. So you, 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 so had to, you had to ask for one away. Did you send for a lot of tickets and then the Vern show was the first one you got? Um, again, I knew someone who was a writer on this show. So we kind of had it in on that. Oh, one. nice. Three's company. I did write in and I have to wait for tickets. And you went for to a tip in three's company as well. Um, I did, but it would have been one of Suzanne Summer's last episodes and she didn't show up. So they, they canceled it and they gave us tickets to see some, some really bad game show that I'm sorry I sat through. Um, what a, what a, that was cool to get into CBS studios. Right. But what a consolation prize. It's like, ah, uh, three's company. No, here, go to a game show. Same thing. These people don't care. But that is, see, I see, I'm sort of the same way where I would have just more enjoyed going into CBS studios would have been the interesting thing. Cause I, uh, I went to school in England and when I got there, I wrote to the BBC saying like, I'm a TV, you know, media studies student. If you have any tapings and every week they would send me just a box of tickets and I would oh. go to a television center every week and see all these things taped. And I kind of almost didn't even care what I was going to see. It was just sort of being in television vision center and seeing all that stuff was kind of fascinating. So I imagine it was probably a similar situation where that was the one time you could actually go into the studio and you were sort of invited in there. must've been pretty cool. My favorite part, and you're not supposed to do this, but Laverne and Shirley was shot, I mean, on the same stage as happy days. So they would only, I don't know which days, which episodes were shot, but 
they would basically just have the sets going for which one they were shooting. And Happy Days in particular, it was the same sets almost every week. So um, while they were on break for Laverne and Shirley, I was with some of my friends and we snuck behind the curtain. Right. And we got to walk back and forth on the Happy Days set, which was really cool. So you were kind of in the diner. They actually had Joni's bedroom, which you rarely see. Oh, wow. They had it all set up with some 50s comic books, which I looked at each one and they were all particularly worthless copies. Oh, I bet they were, yeah. I remember thinking, I bet this would be a cool prop. It was like a Tom and Jerry comic book, which today would be worth about $2. Yeah, yeah. but that So actually, that's an interesting transition. So you... You are a huge comic book fan, specifically the Archies. Oh yeah, I have a major Archie collection. And you're you're an expert on this. They they fact check books with your Archie collection. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I, I hate to use the word expert. Someone of an authority, I guess. Yeah, advisor. And so, what what drew you to Archie when you were when you were a kid? I still don't know what it was. I had seen many cartoons before Archie. The show came out. I only know the day because I still have the ad. It was September 14th, and like I said, the year. <laughs> um, and I was seven years old. And there's something, I, I mean, I think Wacky Races was on before, mm-hmm. Boring Bugs Bunny. I'm not sure what was after it. And there was just that one guitar chord. Boom, everything's Archie. Yeah. And I was glued to that TV set for 30 minutes. I don't think I blinked. I was just so absorbed with these characters and the voices. And, um, I mean, all these shows are on, on DVD now. You can watch them. They don't hold up as well because right. the animation from Filmation was always kind of second rate. Yes. Um, I was obsessed with Archie, and my mother bought me my first Archie comic book within a week. And I don't know. By high school, I was already writing for <laughs> the Overstreet Price Guide. I was somewhat of an advisor on Archie. So um, I still have several thousand Archie comics. It's, Who's it's, your favorite? Ar- I always like Dan DiCarlo's stuff from Archie. Um. I've always had trouble judging because so many of the Archie artists didn't sign their names. Right. And DiCarlo, I think, was the, in terms of stories and the fact that he came up with Josie. Um, yeah, he, he, he's one of their best artists. I would, yeah, he does kind of hold um, the crown for that early to mid-60s era. Right, right, right. So, yeah, DiCarlo is definitely one of the greatest artists. So, you loved Archie, but did you get into sort of the Archie-related cartoons, like Josie and the Pussycats, as you just mentioned? And I love Josie. Stuff? Yeah, I have a complete set of Josie also. Yeah, Josie was one of my favorites, although uh, when they went Much to better s- cartoon. Yeah, much better cartoon and a more, I guess it was more focused, better music as well. Although uh, Much better voices. I never thought the Archie voices matched them. Veronica's accent was too heavy. Betty always sounded like a boy was doing the voice. Right, right. Um, Archie was just really scratchy and like up. Too just pubescent. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know until later it was like a 70 year old man doing Archie's voice. Yeah, I mean, it was always like you'd have like little kids be done by, you know, 70 year old women and it was, it was sort of an old world. Uh, Josie had, they had the best voice actors and the songs are much better. Actually, it's, I, I love the Archie. Did movie. Hanna Barbera do Josie? Yes. Yeah, so that might be better. why it was a lot better because you had Filmation doing Archie and mm-hmm. Hanna Barbera doing Josie. It's, it's, uh, it's inherently better uh, <laughs> until they got to space and then it got a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, but, um, Archie never translated to TV. They, they, as a live action show, do you, do you have any thoughts as to why you thought that just never... They did return to Riverdale, which was a weird... Every TV. decade since the 50s and early 60s, they've been trying to make a live action Archie. Um, the characters, they I mean, even today, well, 25 years ago, they were planning um, a Betty and Veronica feature with Jenny Garth and Shannon Dougherty never got made. Um, I actually spoke with someone at Archie Comics about a year ago. And the current Archie movie, which they quoted, will never be made. It's just right. for publicity. This was their um, so-called cast. Oh. It was um, see, Miley Cyrus as Betty. But this oh, was no. a year and a half ago, so obviously they, they would have changed choices. Selena Gomez as Veronica, Taylor Lautner as Reggie, and they said Justin Bieber for Archie. That is uh, horrific. I wonder if they would make him dye his hair uh, red. And that would he'd probably go for that. I can't imagine. I wonder if kids read Archie comics now because I yeah they they still read them. Do they update them and make them contemporary? I know they did a zombie issue recently, which was kind of strange. Well, Archie dies in July, which he dies a comic book character death, which means they're never yeah they'll be back in six months. Um, they'll be four Archies from outer space, like the death of Superman. They'll be a cyborg Archie and an Archie boy. I'm not particularly fond of killing Archie. I know it's a cartoon character, but. As a child, that would have deeply upset me. Yeah, oh, I imagine. I imagine. And uh, Archie was always, I'm a huge comic book 
uh, guy, I was more into superhero stuff and horror comics was my thing, you know, pre-code fifties horror comics and all that sort of stuff. And I never really got that into Archie, but, um, Archie's supposed to take place in Haverhill, Mass, which is, is very close to where I grew up. And it was very interesting to me because Haverhill always had a reputation as sort of a rough place. Um, like Rob Zombie comes from there and it's, uh, it's not the sort of idealized America that you sort of see in the Archie comics. And I, it always made me curious as to if something had happened or if Archie just wasn't accurate. <laughs> it's probably a mixture of both of those things. Um, but you had mentioned to me earlier that you think that the best Archie adaption is kind of Saved by the Bell. Um, for legal reasons, they'll never admit it was an Archie adaption. Um, I know from the president of Archie Comics, the one that they they are the most annoyed by would be High School Musical. They consider okay. that the most blatant Archie ripoff of all really? time. Really? Yeah, Saved by the Bell, specifically because um, Elizabeth Berkeley's character wasn't in the original script. They kind of added a sixth character. If you remove her, the other five characters, are they are dead on Archie and his yeah, friends. Yeah, pretty much. That, that's true. And, and until you mentioned that, that hadn't really occurred to me. And now I'm like, why? how on earth did I not think that before? That's Lisa crazy. Turtle's the rich girl, and they have Kelly Kapowski would be Betty, and of course Zach is Archie. Screech would be Jughead, and Mario Lopez's character, Slater, is Reggie. Almost offensive to Jughead to equate him with Screech. <laughs> <laughs> Jughead's such a better character. <laughs> um, so, so you're watching the Archies. You also said you love Batman. Uh, I love before Archie. Batman was the only other show that fascinated me on the same degree. Though my mother would not buy me any Batman comics. Why? Do violent? Um, my mother was very selfish, and she would only buy me toys that she could play with. Oh, really? Really? So if Batman didn't interest her. She wouldn't have read them. She wouldn't buy Batman, but she would buy Archie because when I'd come home from school, she'd be in my bedroom reading them. Really? That's yeah. What did your mom do uh, for Nothing. work? Nothing. She, was a house, she was a housewife? <laughs> yes. Um, so your parents weren't in the industry at all? No. No, but you just lived out here. Your mother's reading Archie. That's interesting. So really, so you wanted Batman, but the only way you could get it was on TV, sort of? Um, I don't know. My grandparents bought me a Batman wall, which I still have. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, my mother would not buy Batman. Would she watch the show with you? No. Did she you, wouldn't watch Archie with me. So did your mom watch anything with you? Did you watch television with your family? or? Um... I thought that families really watch TV together. No, I had my own small TV in my bedroom. Um, no, I mean, it would be really difficult to enjoy TV with your parents there making stupid comments. Right, so you think they would ruin it while you're watching stuff? Um, they, they would think that the stuff you're watching was too juvenile or trivial or something. No, the stuff they were watching wasn't really a notch above. True. But, um, no, it was kind of like my comic books, like watching TV wasn't really... I never saw it as a family event. It was like my personal joy. That's you time, yeah. And do you have any siblings? No, I'm only child. No, you're only child. So you're watching this on your own. You're spending time with TV yourself. And I imagine you went to the movies a lot as well. Um, not as much. I mean, I did see a lot of animated films. And um, I was really big on early 70s horror. I mean, I loved Tales from the Crypt and Dr. Five's movies. Right, right, right. I love those films. Did you first discover those on television or seeing them in the no, theaters? No, um, the trailers were on TV. I, I want to see them in the theaters. Okay, so TV is what sort of almost um, enticed you into going to see these things mm -hmm. in the theaters. Uh, I'm a huge fan of those movies as well. Did you? Where did you see them around here? Like, were those Hollywood Boulevard type movies? Or would they play at like a, you know, a much more... Um, reputable theater let's say uh, they were definitely grindhouse movies um i'm trying to if it was tales from the crypt or dr fives one of them i think it was dr fives it, it not only was it not playing in hollywood i remember having to go downtown to the most rundown theater in my life i mean it's kind of the theaters tarantino describes as grindhouses right this is probably um, on like broadway or something yes yeah and i mean people yelling through the movie People throwing things, people fighting. I mean, it was actually scary because I was nine or ten years old. Did you go there by yourself? Um, my mother went with that one, and she, she was not too thrilled either. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I mean, that's a total world apart from sitting in your room by yourself on your little TV watching these things in the comfort of your home, and having to go out into the scary real world to see these movies. I imagine that's just shocking. That was the only one that was really that bad. Um, this was the first Doctor Fives. Yeah, I didn't see the second one. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, yeah, that movie, that's interesting that that would have played in grindhouses. I, I, I guess, you know, it, the companies it was made by and it was marketed as a horror movie, but that's such a smarter movie and almost an elegant movie. And it might have been Tales from the Crypt, um, or wait, it might have been, might have been Trog, that horrible John Crawford. Oh, Trog movie. with Joan Crawford. Um, didn't MGM release that? I doubt it. Yeah. Um, it was definitely something like the bottom rung. Um, 
did you have to sort of beg your mom to take you to see these? I saw this trailer on TV. I really got to see this movie. And she would kind of go, oh, okay, we'll go down there. Well, by the time I was 11, I was going to these movies by myself. But yeah, anything when I was 9 and 10, it was kind of, yeah, I had to drag her along to get in. And would you still go to things like downtown and go to sort no. of... Okay. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine going to downtown. I couldn't even hear the movie in a downtown. Yeah, I was setting. just screaming. There wasn't a thrill to it. It was kind of more annoying. It was, it was like watching something in the high school auditorium with the rowdy kids. Right, who are just kind of there because the air is air conditioning or something. Mm-hmm. They don't even care what they're seeing. So you love these horror movies. You love... Uh, would you say that Archie and Laverne and Shirley and stuff sort of form some of your sense of humor? Or are you gravitated towards the comedy in that? Um, I borrow very heavily from Archie. Um... Particularly in the Vice Academy films, um, Ginger and Linnea are supposed to be Betty and Veronica. That's why um, Ginger's character, Holly, is kind of spoiled and privileged. Um, Betty was never half as slutty as Linnea portrays the right, character. Right, right. But, um, yeah, there there's was still definitely time. A there's still time. <laughs> so, uh, you're watching these horror movies. You're, you love Batman. And you love – it was animated stuff kind of your first love because you mentioned you love Speed Racer as well. I actually wanted to be an animator when I was a child. I actually studied animation for a couple of years. Uh, I was rejected by Cal Arts either two or three years in a row, and live action filmmaking kind of wasn't really what I was planning to do. But in hindsight, animation is so tedious and slow. Right. I and because I have a large enough ego, I don't know if I would have stayed in animation particularly long. Yeah, I mean it's almost the opposite of that Laverne and Shirley thing you saw, where it's boom, 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 we got it done this night. It's very immediate animation is long tedious and we're talking years and years and back and forth and doing these things. So I imagine if you gravitated towards that immediately, yeah, animation would be a real turnoff from that point. Uh, there was still, I mean, Filmation, I think was the last studio making, uh, actually doing animation in the United States probably at that time. Everyone else was sort of situated here, but I think they were still farming out their animation. So maybe it would have been, I mean, Cal, so Cal arts, uh, for people that don't know is sort of the farm team for Disney basically. And everyone who goes to Cal Arts, they sort of teach you that Disney style. <laughs> uh, and I believe Tim Burton went there and studied yeah. as an animator at Disney. He's one of the most famous Cal Arts alumni. Yeah. So that didn't work for you. You said, I'm going to do live action movies. And um, Speed Racer was something I watched all the time. Speed Racer was the first Japanese cartoon I remember. I love Speed Racer. Speed different. Racer, oddly, of all the animated shows from the 60s, it holds up the fast. I mean, I recently picked up a DVD of it. And. I don't know. It's just the same way Archie, I would look at it and go, well, I liked the music, but the animation is so bad and the right. stories are so corny. Speed Racer, it still holds up. It's I mean, well it's animated. Very campy. Yeah, it's campy, but it's fun and it's it's sort of well done. Like, it doesn't seem as much of... That was the thing that always... Um, the Japanese stuff, definitely... I never really got into anime, but the Japanese sort of 60s cartoons and like Kimba and, mm-hmm. and um, Star Blazers, which it was called here, and that sort of stuff really appealed to me because it, it seemed just a better quality. Like it mm-hmm. seemed more like they weren't necessarily making kids stuff. They were just kind of making it. It happened to be animated, but it could have been a live action or they were just putting money into it. So um, gravitating towards that sort of stuff makes sense. Did you see the Speed Racer movie? Uh, Speed Racer also does not translate to live action. No. It probably I, would, just not that one version. Yeah, I mean, that movie, I, I kind of liked it. and I, I Too much CGI for me. There was a lot of CGI, and I imagine that that movie in 20 years, if they still have midnight movies, would be like some college kid midnight movie. Let's Lord get high and watch that movie. <laughs> um, yeah, it was way too juvenile for adults and way too adult for kids. I think it was just sort of somewhere in the middle and not not either thing. Um, you're also watching The Brady Bunch and as in Gilligan's oh, yeah. Island, as you, as you said. I, everyone loved The Brady Bunch. Was that just a huge show that like kids at school would talk about when you were in elementary school? Or Actually, kids at school made fun that I liked that show. Really? Um, Archie Comics and The Brady Bunch and listening to The Carpenters, they're very closely related. They have a very similar... It's that safety factor that these characters don't really live in a real world and nothing right. real bad will ever happen to them. And everything resets at the end. Oh, yeah. It's sort of, there's no, there's no Carpenters continuity. not so much. But well, they're, they're not that's uh, maybe musically, but not. Although the Carpenters had that sort of inherent sadness just dripping through everything that they did. And there was a falseness about it. I mean, their music, it was, nobody was recording stuff like that in the same time period. Right. So their stuff really stood out. But um, Karen Carpenter has such an amazing voice. I mean, it, it's totally timeless. Even right. Today. Oh, absolutely. And a great drummer, <laughs> which people seem to forget about. So you're watching these shows. Are uh, you going to Hollywood High School? You're writing these scripts to try and get sitcoms. And did you, did you imagine yourself and when you thought of yourself as an adult being a, a sitcom writer, or were you just saying, this is the in that I have. We know someone who works on the show, so I'll write, I'll write an episode of the show. I think I, would, I had plans that long term. Um, I don't know. It's like, well, I mean, 
how many people can say like your English teacher, you know, can get a script submitted to Three's company or <laughs> uh, none. Actually, it was my other English teacher from um, junior year who had contacts at Charlie's Angels, which oddly, I remember writing a script for Charlie's Angels, submitting it through my teacher, never hearing back anything. And a year later, a kind of condensed, modified version of it appeared on the air. Which is crazy. I mean, <laughs> so, so my first question would be, how does that even come up with your teacher? Like, was this teacher just like, hey, I happen to know some people that work on Charlie's Angels or, you know. In Hollywood High School, kind of, yeah. Um, really? Yeah, almost everyone kind of, because so many former students, like John Ritter went to Hollywood High School, that t yeah, a lot of teachers kind of knew people in the business. Right, it's kind right. of a given. Right. So maybe they taught someone who worked there, and that's how they knew these people. Mm -hmm. And so was Charlie's Angels a show that you watched every week? I love Charlie's Angels. Yeah. Charlie's Angels um, is the series. That is what Vice Academy is based on. And yeah, the title is borrowed from Police Academy. The scripts are from Charlie's Angels. Right. I was going to say, that it does have a very Charlie's Angels mm -hmm. sort of vibe to it. So you wrote this script. You, you sent it in. Never hear anything. You, you sit down to watch your weekly dose of Charlie's Angels, as you did every week. And what was your reaction like? Like, we... um, Probably one of the very first times my jaw was really dropped. Because I remember... Mine was called Angel Dust, and they retitled it Angel Drugs. Which I don't even think is a thing. <laughs> I remember, probably more acceptable for TV broadcast standards. Right. But um, Cheryl Ladd is still doubling as, instead of a high school student, a college student who the girls don't like and beat up on. And I remember Jacqueline and Kate were, I think, teachers, or one was a, I don't remember the exact one. Right. I, I just remember, um, up until the three-quarter mark, it was really, really close to the one I wrote. The ending, they, it was completely different. But um, I, mean, I have no doubt they definitely read mine. I don't think they mimicked it. I'm sure it definitely was in the back of their mind on some level. Right, right. So you, so you were just like, well, that's how it is out here. I kind of just have to just deal with it. Um, even then, teachers were telling me, um, you're still in high school. You don't really want to be suing a studio. <laughs> right, right, right. You're going to end any career you may have before it even starts by doing that if you're suing a studio. But I think I learned really early on. Um, I mean, when you're doing in a film, um, feature films in particular, if you have a really good title, don't use it when you um, post the film in Variety for casting because people can see your title and borrow it. And they'll steal it. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can't actually um, own or copyright a title. So I've been, I mean, almost every film I've made was in production under a fake title. Just to sort of throw them off the scent before you could. Yeah. That's interesting. That's I mean, interesting. I certainly did not make Vice Academy telling everyone that's what it was called. What was your fake title for Vice Academy? I remember all the sequels. Um, I know three was Crime of the Century. Four was Till Marriage Do Us Part. Um, beach movie, yeah, I'm trying to remember. They, they all had um, intentional fake titles. Um, oh, Bikini Banners was Vice Academy 6. Oh, nice. nice. But yeah, um, they were all in production under different titles. So you graduate Hollywood High School, and then you want to go into film production? Um, wanted to be an animator, though CalArts shot that one down. Right. So uh, instead, I went to LA City College, where I was laughed at by all the professors. Um, using a fake 10 page script, I shot my first feature at 21. Which is was, Blood Theater, right? Yeah. Was told repeatedly, cut it to 10 minutes long. Um, cut it to 10 minutes long? I'm not sure what I would have done with a bad 10 you minute know, movie. What do you do with a 10 minute movie? But, um. But Mary Warrenov is in that movie. Yeah. And that's amazing. I mean, how did you. Mary's a very gracious woman. She certainly did not need to do this, but I sent her the script. I really did not think she would do it. Uh, we met for lunch uh, at Schwab's Pharmacy. Yes. The famous <laughs> um, Schwab's. It was very classic. She said she would do it. I was in shock. She did the movie. She saves it from being never released. Um, and you had watched her in, like I imagine, like Hollywood Boulevard. And, uh, Hollywood uh, Boulevard is my favorite movie of all time. Yeah. Do you think that you gravitate towards the movie Hollywood Boulevard because you grew up here? Um, no, actually, when I was 18, they screened it in film school. We had to sit through all these boring prerequisite movies, uh, Potemkin, 39 Steps, and quality film. And I was like yawning through these things. And the teacher showed Hollywood Boulevard as a joke the last day of class, and everyone laughed at the movie. I was, I mean, the minute I saw that film, and it, it was shot in like a week for 25 grand. I instantly knew that was the type of film I wanted to make. It clicked. You were like, this is, yeah. it sort of justified how you, you said, this is, I found my people. This is yeah, my I mean, thing. I, I mean, I knew a big budget film was never really going to be an opportunity. I just remember looking at this going, this is something I could do. Right. So you, so you make Blood Theater. 
Um, people are telling you to cut it to 10 minutes. So what do you do next? How do you... Um, unlike everyone else I went to film school with, I knew how to get a studio drive-on pass at all the major studios. So um, I submitted the film. It was screened by like 30 different places. Um, I mean, I'd be laughed at at school and at the end of class, I would drive to Warner Brothers <laughs> or drive to 20th Century Fox or Paramount. Right, so you're the one actually on a studio lot. Yeah, I mean, it was fun. I mean, people in school were not my audience. Um, right. I mean, it did not get a major distributor, but it got, you know, got released, it got out on, on video. Um, did it ever play theatrical? Did you do a screen? No. no. I mean, I've, I've been made it, like two years ago, we screened it for the 25th For the first, right, right, right. Um, but most importantly is uh, Blood Theater got me my second film. <laughs> right, right. So um, by 23, I had a second film. By 25, I made Hobgoblins, and I was a working director. That's pretty good. I'm pretty good in. Um, one of the shows you wrote down here was Real People. You had an interesting <laughs> story about that. Um, yeah, one of the ways I learned how to get studio drive-on passes when I was in high school, um, I don't know why I seemed to have an industry job at 17. Um, Why not? You're here. <laughs> I was doing these Rocky Horror conventions, um, and the last one was in conjunction with 20th Century Fox to promote Shock Treatment, which is Rocky Horror's sequel. And um, real people actually uh, showed up and taped the final convention. So, I mean, I look back on the tape today, and I mean, it's this massive hotel in Anaheim with like 300 people. And I'm looking at that and going, I was in high school and I was putting these things. Right, on. right. It's but almost that's how I did. I mean, whenever someone at a young age accomplishes big things, it's impressive. But at the same time, uh, you sort of have to be not know enough about the world to take on something like like that in the first place. To know that you know, if you if you almost know too much, you would already discount even trying to do that. You're, this, this, a human being couldn't do this. But when you're seventeen, eighteen, you know, twenty, twenty three, you're like, yeah, oh yeah, I could totally handle that because you you haven't ever failed doing it sort of so it's so it's sort of a double-edged sword there on on, on attempting to do that sort of stuff so are, are you actually in the segment can you see yourself in there um i hated being in front of the camera they only interviewed me for like a minute or two and unfortunately i'm not in it which i didn't really want to be in it so it worked out um but i mean when you look at the convention i mean it was the largest of the four it was the final one of this of the ones i did but I remember looking back and it, it was like, it was definitely a scope. I mean, I don't really remember it being that large. Right. But, you know, Did you grew. used to go see Rocky Horror? And um, I was never hugely into Rocky Horror. I've seen it a total of nine times, never twice in the same theater. Right, right, right. So you're getting these sort of promotional jobs to get the to get the passes on the studio a lot, or specifically, or just to work in the industry, or just to have a job and have some pocket money as a teenager? Um... For some reason, I was just in a major hurry to get into the business, and I just looked at every opportunity from writing scripts while I was in high school, you know, to promoting something for Fox. These are just opportunities to kind of be in the business on some level, and you can't really dispute that I wasn't. Right, right, right. So you're just getting your in. And so around, uh, when was First Vice Academy? It was 25 years ago, so that would be 89 was the first time that you came made out. it. Um, so that was that was the movie I think that I, I first heard of your stuff from um, because I started on USA Up All Night, which uh, was that the first place it was really shown? Um, Playboy, I'm not sure. Um, without ever screening it, they wanted the first Vice Academy. Playboy um, did? Yeah. Um, I, I had a feeling because Ginger Lynn was in it. They probably oh, right. thought it was um, actually going to deliver a little more softcore thrills, which <laughs> was not made for that station. Right. Um, I don't think they were, they got particularly good ratings for them, but, um, they actually beat USA Network to the punch, but USA Network, when they saw the movie, they instantly grabbed it and they were really the ones who, um, pushed me into doing all the sequels, which so, I'm not complaining. So did you shop it to USA or, um, cause you produced that completely independently on your own. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember some, someone else, some other distributor I knew, the place that had hobgoblins that wasn't paying me, Gee, that's one in a series. Um, they actually were the first ones to sell something to USA Network, and I was floored at the price they got from it. And I knew if I went through them, I would never see any of the money. And I was very fearless at just calling places blindly and not right. really caring. Because what do you have to lose? Um, I mean, most people don't really. I remember this is one of my favorite jokes I used to play in film school students. It's like, you shoot a feature, you want a distributor to look at it, you call them up, what department do you ask for? Nobody ever knows the answer. It's called acquisitions. Right. Um, 
Yeah, I called USA Network. I mean, I certainly had no problem making these calls blindly. Um, submitted the film. Uh, yeah, they grabbed it really quickly. So they air this. And USA Network up all night uh, replaced a show called Night Flight, which I absolutely mm -hmm. loved, which was a very strange sort of uh, mishmash of clips and news segments and music videos and documentaries and short animated films. And USA Up All Night started in 87. It would be from 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday till 5 in the morning. It would pick up a lot of uh, B movies. that You'd see a lot of horror movies. Um, and it was sort of a national scale version of what had been going on locally in a lot of different areas. So I imagine you, you watched Elvira when it was on here in L.A. She, oh, yeah. was, she was sort of the big horror host in the, in the early 80s up, up through the 80s before she went national. Was that... Did you used to watch a lot of these late night horror and sort of B movie shows when they were on? Is that where you, I mean, you saw a lot of these things theatrically, but I imagine that would have been the end for some of the more obscure stuff. I always sought out really bad movies. Um, my personal favorite was still Robot Monster. Robot Monster. I mean, Real I know man. KHJ and KTLA. I'm not, I think the film is public domain, that thing. It was always on. And did you recognize like like uh, was it uh, Bronson Canyon and stuff as all in those movies? And... You can't miss Bronson Canyon. Yeah, when yeah. You see. There's like one cave that appears. In it. Once you've right. seen Batman, you'll know Bronson Canyon for life. Was it strange? Li I've been to Bronson Canyon. Yeah, no, I was going to say, was it strange living in this area and being a huge fan of Batman and Robot Monster? And uh, you know, there's Bronson Canyon. There's like the very, very recognizable part of this TV show in this movie. Or is it something you just sort of take for granted as being there? Bronson Cave is so small. When you actually go there, I remember it was more this puzzlement of how did they fit the Batmobile in this cave? Oh, right. It, the cave, it's like this, it's probably the size of like double of an average person's living room. Right. It's, I mean, you can, it's like a two car garage with maybe a rear entrance. It is really small. Right, right. So, um. Just like the audiences for Laverne and Shirley. Then. I mean, it looks really large on film because I guess the hill is large and there's a, the canyon behind it. But the actual cave itself, I mean, you, you could not get a truck in there. So do you think seeing things like that made you realize that with things like Vice Academy, you know, I can make a small movie that looks a lot bigger. Like I, I, I realized that there, there are tricks now, uh, you know, uh, this cave looks like it's the bat cave, but it's actually very tiny. So, you know, I, that makes it more accessible and more, you know, makes you feel like you have more of an ability to make something that uh, really looks real uh, with, um, with having much smaller resources. Um, I think most of the production value in my film, it, it's again, a level of fearlessness of, I learned this when I was in film school because everyone else would get a permit when they shot their movies. And to me, getting a permit, it, it's not, it's not real filmmaking. It has a right. safety net. There's something about parking a van to block a full view of a building, setting all the camera equipment up behind it. Uh, I never called it guerrilla filmmaking. I'm not really sure where that term comes from because I wasn't at war with anyone. The particular term I like to use, I called it hit and run filmmaking, right. which is literally showing up somewhere. You do something really quick, almost like a hit and run accident. You pile everyone in the van and you get the hell out of there before right. anyone sees. Right. And did you ever get caught doing that? Um, I looked like a film. I looked like I was in high school. I was 35. So you could pull off. I'm just oh, yeah, I mean, student film. You know, the police would um, talk with me and I spoke my way around getting shut down almost every time. Right. Fire department, you cannot talk your way out of. Right. So cops are easier. You fire department will shut you down. Yeah. So Vice Academy airs on USA up all night and they showed a lot of movies, but for some reason that movie became almost the signature USA up all night movie. It seemed to air more than all the other movies and get uh, a lot more of a reaction. It was my, my sense of it. I don't know if that... Vice Academy? Only because they told me this, and I, I mean, based on when I would do renewals and sequels, Vice Academy was their highest rated movie of all time on Up All Night. Yeah. A typical film on Up All Night, they would license it for two years. It would debut with like a 1.3, 1.4 rating. The first rerun, it would drop to a 0.9. Then after that, it would drop to like a 5. And they wouldn't bother renewing it. Vice Academies, they were their only films they debuted at 2.3, 2.4. Nothing, they had nothing that would break it to. Right. First rerun, the films would still get 1.8, 1.9. Fifth rerun, they would still get 1.7. They said they had, no, they, they had no other film that could do that. Right. So, because they, they renewed those films for seven years. Oh, yeah. I mean, they aired all the time and they would do marathons. I mean, they would yeah. do them all night. And you, you shared an interesting anecdote with me when you made the first Vice Academy, you, it was on Entertainment Tonight. Yeah, I, I didn't even know. Um, even Vice Academy 2, they never showed anything, but they mentioned the day it came out. But the first Vice Academy, some other 
film debuted on video the same day. I think it was The Abyss, and they were showing a clip. And then I hear the Vice Academy theme, and I don't know, they just segued into, um, there's Mary Hart talking about Vice Academy's out on VHS today, and they're showing footage of Ginger Linnae, and I was, I don't know how it's, they pulled it off or why they... Someone they who worked there was a fan? Or? I, w- I was definitely thrilled. So you stayed up that night so you could tape the... Uh... Oh, yeah, I have a, I wish, I would, I would love to have a really good copy of this but i have like a really bad it was on cbs which in la is channel two which if back in the days of antenna tv the lower numbers got the worst reception right so i think on, on fox on 11 always looked good when you taped them seven wasn't oh, bad two always looked bad it was the opposite uh where i was where the the higher the station the worse it would be so yeah um i, I don't have a good tape of it but i definitely have a tape of you it. had a vcr very early you said oh, yeah i had a vcr and 78, 79. I mean, that's very... Did you tape a lot of stuff and oh, yeah. watch them? Did you do that because you you really liked the shows or you were trying to learn from them? I'm still in high school. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, when I was a senior in high school, I was kind of shooting what I consider my first movie. It's something I will never put as a DVD bonus. Um, it's Night of the Loving Dead. It's a parody <laughs> about hookers who return to life and rape the living. It's Obviously. so good. Shot at a Hollywood... Um, Forever Cemetery, where we got thrown out of, didn't stop me from going back. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was, I mean, I knew in my own level, I was kind of making my own films. I don't know if I really knew where they were going to be going at that point, but um, I did like having a VCR. Yeah, it did give me an opportunity to play with editing. I had a second VCR within a year. So you would do deck to deck, so you oh, yeah. could make your own stuff, mm-hmm. uh, which is unusual at the time, absolutely. And so Vice Academy starts airing. The first one airs. It's doing very, very well. So USA basically said, make us a sequel. Um, I had just done Mark for Murder, which was my only film to play theatrically overseas, my biggest budget film. And I was really waiting for you know, bigger films to come my way. And... I do have this theory, if by your third movie you haven't done a big budget, it's never going to happen for okay, you. Okay, okay. So I kind of knew, um, I think I had five films done by then. So um, I actually had a script of Hobgoblins too at the time. And Hobgoblins to this day, of any film I've made, it's sold to more territories overseas, something like 55. Wow. Um, people laugh at the movie. It was a very successful film when it was first made. Um, on I, TV when I was first made or did it play? Th- no, it wasn't play television. Th- it was most, it was, um, up until the first Vice Academy, the primary market for films in that era was overseas. Okay. Um, did you ever travel and see them play in other countries or? I didn't. I did have an opportunity to go to Japan for the, um, I guess the debut of Vice Academy. I was going to go, but first of all, there wasn't pay, there wasn't an interpreter, there wasn't a tour guide. That sounds scary. And it was literally, I would get off the plane, have to find a video store, make an appearance, go to a couple other video stores, get back on the plane and come home. Yeah, that doesn't sound like so it's worth it. I kind of said, you know, maybe if there's an extra day or I had an interpreter, but... I'm, yeah, if you're flying 48 hours on a plane, maybe you spend a little time there. So, basically every year, USA Network would say, do another one for six um, years? I was probably, well, the first one was much more their idea. Um, it wouldn't actually become concrete for another year or two, but by the time I did the second Vice Academy, the remainder of the films I would do, it didn't matter what I would write or pitch. They'd always wait for me to stop talking. And this wasn't just USA, it was every distributor and say, right. you have another Vice Academy. Right. So I wasn't planning to make six of them. It was kind of, I mean, when I tried branching out, um, I did Good Girls Don't. I did the Bikini movie, which um, under the title Bikini Academy, I was trying to make another Vice Academy clone that would last for a while. Um, they just wanted Vice Academy sequels, so I kind of just stopped writing other movies right. for That's a while. That's what they want. That's what you'll mm-hmm. give them. And, and Vice Academy almost sort of became the closest thing to a television series. I mean, it was... I thought of it as a series. Yeah. yeah, you thought of it as a TV series. You're Charlie's Angels, basically. Mm-hmm. And so after the sixth one, did you just feel like you were tapped out or you've done everything you could do with it? I had a script for a seventh one. Um, much like most TV shows, when you make too many sequels, there's always a joke of, you know, how many seasons should a show have been on? It's always one less than it actually had. Right, right. The same thing with when you make too many sequels. Vice Academy 5 was the last one that really had the fuel of the earlier ones. I got most of the cast back for 6. 6 didn't have the energy of the other films. Okay. Um, 
these films were getting made less than a year apart by that point that um i think it was three and four or four and five but we would go back to the same locations and our tape marks from the last film were still on the was floor. still there right yeah so that's an indicator maybe we should take a little time between these if we wanted to have something um that you could actually really get into and do, do you find that most people mostly know you from the vice academy movies from from the usa airings or is it probably hobgoblins I uh, was Vice Academy for years, and Hobgoblins the last 10 years has kind of um, surpassed Vice Academy. So Hobgoblins, it was, it was very popular overseas when it first came out. When did you do that, 87? Yeah. Um, and then it was sort of rediscovered through Mystery Science Theater, for better yeah. or worse. As much as people laugh, they just renewed the film for five more years. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you're, you're, you're laughing sort of all the way <laughs> to the bank with it. But um, and I imagine that was probably sort of you know, not your preferred method of it, that, that movie airing, but do you find that people discovered it in a way, because when Elvira would show movies that were like Robot Monster, she would do these interjections and cut into them, and you probably still enjoyed the movie. Uh, I sometimes would find it annoying, as much as I loved Elvira, I would kind of be like, I'm, I'm watching this movie, stop doing this. Um, you know, and there are probably people, I imagine, who feel that way about Hobgoblins, to the, to the point where, was that what fueled the sequel, that sort of renewed interest? Um, of course. I mean, Hot Goblins 2, I, it was pretty much a film that was never going to get made. And, you know, you do so many Vice Academies and you've beaten that dead horse. It's like, mm, what other sequel cow do I have? Right. Um, the story, I'm always amazed that so many people somehow know that I submitted Hot Goblins to uh, Mystery Science Theater. And the actual event was um, USA Network acquired Sci-Fi Channel, which starting in the sixth or seventh year of Mystery Science Theater, yeah. um, it moved from Comedy Central over to Sci-Fi. So um, USA uh, Up All Night was kind of being phased out. It was yeah. like the final it year. It ended in 97, the same year that, that they mm -hmm. switched over to Sci-Fi. for. Mystery so Science. they had actually submitted all of my films to the writers at Best Brains for Mystery Science Theater um, because they had the rights and they own both stations. Right. And, um, no, I wasn't bothered. I mean, USA Network made fun of my movies. It was kind sure. of, my films lend themselves to, you know, people making jokes while they're airing. So I kind of knew what it was in the beginning. Um, then writers of Best Brains contacted me and they said, well, these films are too sexual for us. What else do you have? And I knew from the beginning they would want Hobgoblins. I made them sit through everything else. I gave them Blood Theater. Visitance, which was the one I really, really wanted them to take. This right. was too intentionally campy. And I still have all the rejection letters. And they finally said, is there anything else you have? And, you know, I cringe and I sent them Hobgoblins. Because um, that was, was that your favorite movie? You no, know? I it was my least favorite movie. Okay. I am so, I was embarrassed the film before Mr. Science Theater ever aired it. Right. Um, it's not my favorite movie. It was never on my director's reel. So, so, so I, I knew that was the one they would take because it's so bad. Right. So that's kind of why you probably held on. They, on it. no, they grabbed it. I mean, they watched it and they, they licensed that film in 20 hours. So your three's company's too sexual. Vice Academy's too sexual. Uh, for best brains, but not sexual enough for Playboy. <laughs> it's sort of, uh, even not sexual enough for anyone, but, yeah. um, though oddly, I, I think I hold the record of, Hobgoblins, which would probably get a PG rating, they had to clip seven or eight minutes of raunchy dialogue. Raunchy dialogue? For, I mean, if you watch the film and watch the Mystery Science Theater broadcast, I mean, every third line is so offensive, it's clipped from the movie. Like, right, right, right. What color are the rugs here, Daphne? You're good at being under the tables. The same colors, the carpet burns on my knees. And I, got, I mean, jokes like that were just pulled one after another. But those are very sitcom y jokes. I mean, they're oh, they very got Three's you. Company type double entendre jokes. They're not that much more extreme than the stuff that would have aired on this um, company. They, they really bitched about how raunchy the film was. I, I remember when I was watching it, I figured out by 10 or 15 minutes in, I could guess which jokes were going to be cut. Right. And I remember thinking, what joke do I know is going to not make it? And sure enough, like, Amy's terrified of motorcycles. She won't ride on one. Like, And she pauses, and I'm thinking, they won't let her say Gone. the next line. They clipped it. It's like, yeah. um, let's see what the exact order. Uh, riding a motorcycle is like sitting on the world's largest vibrator. Boy, did they cut that one. <laughs> oh, I can imagine that would be out of there. So so that was, uh, your films are sort of discovered on TV and, and sort of the same way you discovered a lot of these movies on TV. And did you ever have a desire to try and write for television uh, after that? Or was it kind of I that would like you to. in high school? It's just, um, 
I have such an odd niche. And I think TV is much more writing by assembly. Not that I wouldn't right. like to. Um, it's kind of once you've done a lot of low budget features, your opportunities are very limited. Right. Um, I mean, as much as I wanted to branch out to other types of films, there certainly was never much interest for them. Right, but that's also the genre that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you watch now? Are there shows that you watch now, or things that you enjoy? Um, kind of much more into watching DVDs of stuff. That's yeah, yeah. No, I, I am the same way. I have a tough time catching up on current things. Uh, it's odd too. There doesn't seem to be as many opportunities like USA Up All Night or even MST3K for people to sort of discover these lower budget or B movies or um, independent films now. So I wonder, you know, what do you think is the future of the sorts of movies that like the movies you make are, is it the internet? Is it, um, you know, sort of crowdsourcing or, <laughs> or, or, you know, maybe you don't know. Uh, the future, unfortunately, is probably a lot of piracy. Um, yeah. I spend a couple hours every week having to get, um, you know, particularly YouTube, um, looking for bootlegs of my films. You know, I don't care if people upload 10 minutes of them. Right. Even if you break the film into nine chapters, I don't like when people upload the entire movie in one right. piece because um, it is copyright infringement. Those are people who will not be paying to watch it on Amazon or iTunes. Right. So it, it sounds harmless. I don't know if those people are really getting a financial gain by uploading my films, particularly Hobgoblins. Um, well, they're lumping these movies. They probably look at big studios and say, oh, there's not a, one guy that made this movie. It's not affecting mm -hmm. them, which is obviously not the case with your stuff. Hobgoblins, too. This one, I mean, I can't even name a precedent, but uh, 24 hours after it came out on DVD, it was uploaded for free viewing on 35 websites. Oh, jeez. Jeez. So, so I remember that as like a full-time job. And those places won't take it down. I mean, I just remember the day after it came out, going online to look for reviews, and I could not believe how many websites it was already on. Jeez. Um, so you had an amazing story, too, I should mention, where you're, you're the first person I've talked to in all the episodes I've recorded of this that's actually ever written a TV Guide crossword. Uh, yes, I did. Um, I was 18, bored out of my mind in screenwriting class, uh, as many of my classes in L.A. City College were. Um, for some reason, I, I don't know why I had a piece of graph paper on me. Maybe I was planning it. Um, I sat down and figured... Hmm, while well, this teacher's boring me for an hour, I wonder if I could do a TV Guide crossword puzzle. And I remember counting how many squares it was across. And I don't know why. I somehow figured out you start them from the middle, not from the ends. I remember putting a really long word across. Right. And That's a difficult skill for something you've never done before. I did it one hour. It was actually not that hard. I mean, there are people who you know, are famous crossword writers and have their, and you just kind of banged it out. Did you do the crossword puzzles every week yourself or? Never. No, you'd never done them. You're just like, ah, I don't like crossword puzzles. See if I can just do it. My mother used to do them and I find them really inane. <laughs> right. So you just write this out and then you said, maybe I'll just send it to TV Guide. Why not? Um, I was so fearless, much like I approached Barry Warnoff to do my first film. I, you know, I just did stuff, and I remember sending it in, never heard anything for like six months, so I didn't even really think about it. And I did save a copy of the original just so I had it, and just getting a check in the mail for it that we've published here. They didn't say what date it was going to be out, and I had to look at TV Guide every week for like a couple months, and I found it. That's amazing. So it's almost redemption for the Charlie's Angels incident. You're, uh, you're yeah. not, a, not a great consolation, but you're all getting all $70. I got all it, yeah. $70 for that in there. Best uh, investment from film school I ever got. Did you ever make bets with people? Be like, I bet I can solve this puzzle in five minutes. I never did them. So uh, no, um, my mother used to do them. So I was never really, did she them. do that one? Um, it was funny because I had told her for months to look for it. I told her what words were in it. I remember, I think, one down was order for mail, BLT, because I, I always remember it that way. Right. Um, she co did it and completely missed it, and some friend of mine said, isn't that yours that's in this week? And I flipped it, sure enough. There it was. So, yeah, she, she, I mean, she said, that was a difficult one. It's like, yeah, you should, I told you to look for it. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, I this still is have it. Unprecedented. Yes, we're looking at it right now. I'll take some pictures of it for people for the, for the Tumblr. Uh, and finally, the way I end every episode, Rick, is uh, TV Guy is not just informative, it's opinionated. A cheers and a jeers. So if you were to have a, a cheer and a jeer for television, uh, what would they be? Um, probably my jeer would be that, why isn't there a show to replace USA's Up All Night? I mean, 
I get so much email online of people of like, are the Vice Academy films ever coming back on? I mean, you would say it was a great niche for what it was. The show never lagged in ratings. It was right. just USA Network was sold a couple times in one year. I think Seagram's was the one purchase. And they were trying to change their format of what they were viewing and airing. So they didn't renew up all night. But um, I remember cringing at the moment because they had three years left on my contracts and one by one they'd elapse. And USA went from the number one basic rated cable network to number 10. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them become a lot more faceless. Like you had Joe Bob Briggs Monster Vision. You had uh, USA used to air that show Real Wild Cinema that showed a lot of the something mm -hmm. weird stuff. And I think that as we've gotten further into the 21st century, the stations almost have less of an identity, but at the same time have very niche you know, USA is like the, the law and order network, or, you know, it, it doesn't, they don't have, and they also don't have the face of networks anymore. They don't have people host things. It's almost like it's less and less human as time goes on. So I would like to, I would agree with that. I would love to see more shows like that. Oh, my other jeer would be sci-fi channel for just getting stuck on those really bad asylum mockbuster monster movies. Yeah. Those films are unwatchable with their bad CGI and has been actors that even I would hesitate to use. <laughs> and my, but I mean, people watch them. Yeah. I mean that I remember which one like Sharknado or Sharknado is actually some classic, but okay. um, <laughs> the one with Debbie Gibson and Tiffany. Oh yeah. Like Shark yeah. Puss. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. They're, they're you know, they have so much premise on the title. I remember thinking, this will be entertaining, and they're unwatchable. Right. It's all sizzle, no steak. They're, it's no, almost they're like selling the movie poster and not making an actual movie. They're all green screen where, I mean, no matter where they are, those actors are in a studio, and it's like, gee, why don't we use the same four-second shot of a, of a fish swimming towards the camera every ten seconds? Right, right. I mean, they're, I don't know, it just... They don't know the charm those movies did, and they're knocking those things out really quickly. Yeah, it's like a factory. I think that mm -hmm. you're not getting um, sort of an individual person's vision. You're not getting one person who says, I want to make a movie that, you know, whether it be silly, whether it be fun, whether it be a B movie or a horror movie or a cult independent movie, it's still my vision. And I feel like those sci-fi movies, they, they actually do have a formula. They say, we need this to happen every couple minutes, uh, give us a snappy name, and then we don't care what else happens. And it's done by committee, and it's done by, uh, it's it's sort of a McDonald's version of, <laughs> of junk food. You could go to an independent mom and pop greasy spoon, and it's going to have more charm than a McDonald's who's sort of hammering this stuff out with sort of no heart to it. I did particularly enjoy both Ian Ziering and Tara Reed's comments of, yeah, you can expect to see me back in Sharknado too. Like, <laughs> yeah, what else was on your plate? Right, right. I'm sorry, I was rude. It was never in doubt. <laughs> never in doubt. Well, Rick, thank you so much for taking the time to do the show. I really appreciate it. it was thank great you. Talk. And there you have it. That was Rick Sloan, film director, Archie enthusiast, and crossword puzzle writer, Rick Sloan. Really fun episode. What an interesting guy. Definitely, if you've never seen any of his movies, definitely check them out. Pick up the DVDs. I also always enjoy his commentary tracks. They're always uh, highly entertaining and informative. You'll definitely enjoy them as much as I do, I guarantee you. So, as always, please continue to like us on Facebook. Email me at canandicanread.com. Let me know what you think of the shows, if you have any ideas for the shows or requests. And go to our Facebook page, as I mentioned. That's Facebook TV Guidance Counselor. Go to the Tumblr. Any place that you want to, really, that you can find out about the show. Rate the show, review the show, and we'll see you again next week on Wednesday for TV Guidance Counselor. <laughs> <laughs>